Hello, everybody. I'm Professor Rachel Skinner, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Wellbeing, Health and Youth NHMRC Centre of Research Excellence in Adolescent Health. And I'm, I'm very pleased to, um, to be hosting this um, webinar this week while Kate's away on leave. And um, so we've got a very interesting presentation for you. And I note that we have um, quite a number of audience members already online. So I might just get started. I first of all want to acknowledge the funding support that we have received for um, the establishment of, of our Centre of Research Excellence, Wellbeing, Health and Youth. And there are all our funders on the screen. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and cultures. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Now, I'm just letting people know who may not be aware that um, WHMY Community of Practice is a place um, you can go to where um, researchers, clinicians, policy, policy makers and young people come together to share ideas and exchange information. And there you can find resources, um, publications of interest. We post there of relevance to youth health and wellbeing. And also all of our past webinars are on this site. So um, please, um, any, anybody who hasn't had a look, go there and, and see what, what is there of, of interest. There's a lot there. All right. So just a bit of housekeeping. So if you'd like to make any comments, just put them into that, that chat box at the, at the bottom right hand um, section of your screen. Um, that's the easiest place to put in your, you can, you can make comments, but also if you want to pose a question to the speaker, you can put it in there and we will field the questions um, and and we can have our Q&A at about 12.45. So your microphone will be muted and your video will be switched off throughout. And so just communicate through that, um, chat, that chat function. But now I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Partridge. Stephanie's a dietitian and senior research fellow at the School of Health Sciences at the University of Sydney. And her research is focused on improving nutrition and physical activity behaviors in young people using digital technology. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie now. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, and thank you to the um, Y for inviting me to present today. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'd also just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm presenting on today, which is the Gadigal people and pay my respects to um, elders past, present and emerging. Now, I usually start my talks usually going into, I guess, some negative um, things around how, you know, health behaviours and things like that. But I thought I'd start off this webinar um, with some positive news. So I really like this quote um, that was in one of the World Health Organisation um, reports, which is that young people are not beings in becoming, but rather citizens of today with the right to be respected and heard during their teenage years and then during their transition into adulthood. And I think this has been exemplified lately um, in the digital space, particularly um, with these two examples. So um, here's an example of a news site um, run on Instagram by young people. Um, and we, I heard about this news site um, recently when we're doing some focus groups with young people. So they're able to consume um, news just in a few Instagram tiles and find out the latest um, that's happening, I guess, with the COVID pandemic and other news that's relevant to young people. And I guess this other news story on the right hand side really made my day on Friday. Uh, so I had been using this website to you know, get statistics on the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccine rates. And it was um, run by three teenagers from Melbourne and they um, were able to identify themselves after they got their first vaccine shot on Friday. So I thought that was a really good news story for young people. So today I'll take you through um, my research, which is focused on mostly on obesity prevention in young people using digital technologies. So I'll briefly go over um, 
what we know about the digital environment, um, touch on some risk factors um, for Australian young people, um, go over the overweight and obesity rates for young people um, in New South Wales, um, go briefly go over what we have what we know about the national obesity strategy and the consultation that's underway with that at the moment. I'll also talk you through some evaluation that we've done around the current strategies, uh, overweight and obesity um, prevention and management strategies for adolescents in New South Wales. I'll talk you through um, the two digital health studies that we're currently running. And if I have time, I'll briefly touch on some of the work that we're doing in the online food delivery space. So I guess our digital environment is becoming more and more a part of our uh, everyday life. And I guess over the last few decades, but more so really over the last two years during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've really become reliant on digital environments and digital services to help um, keep our lives going. So it is the environment um, both in nature and throughout life, which determines whether an individual's um, Pre, um, an individual's genetic predisposition to obesity will manifest or not. And I really like this diagram that was by um, Seema, Megan and Louise in the um, Medical Journal of Australia that was published in 2018. And it really gives a good oversight of all of the different influences um, um, determining whether someone will um, have an energy imbalance and then potentially um, develop obesity. And we know from the emerging research that it's definitely not a lack of willpower that we're seeing in the in the population. There is all these external influences, which is um, increasing the rates of overweight and obesity that we're seeing. And I guess the area that I'm particularly interested in is around the societal and political influences, particularly the media, our public um, public health approaches, um, as well as um, social norms and um, social media and those kind of factors. So. Looking at our digital environment, so this data is from the eSafety Commission, which was a survey done about the digital lives of Australian teenagers, and it was published around this time last year. And I think the data was collected pre-pandemic. So this is excluding, um, you know, virtual learning and online, online learning. So young people are spending roughly um, over 14 hours a week online. Um, nine out of 10 are going online to research, to watch videos, um, chat with friends, they're using upwards of four social media services. So at the time, um, the most popular ones were YouTube and Instagram and TikTok was on the rise. And I wouldn't be surprised if TikTok has now um, sort of come up into that top two position. And then we're seeing, um, so they're spending a lot of time on social media. And then by the time they're 16 years of age, over 80% of young people in Australia have access to a debit card in their name. So they are becoming consumers and they have the opportunity to um, purchase products and um, services online as well. And then this is what they're exposed to online. So from our recent cross-sectional study with over 300 young people, um, in Australia, this was the top influencer that they reported following here, which is um, Chloe Ting. So they're showing, uh, they're being shown this is, I guess, the ideal body image and potentially purchasing workout videos relating um, from these influencers. Um, they're being advertised to by big global companies such as um, food delivery services who have, um, you know, a lot of fun, a lot of um, uh, money to be able to get big celebrities to help promote their, their services. Um, they're being exposed to, I guess, documentaries with this um, What the Health being another one that was reported as being really popular on our cross-sectional survey. So they're getting a slightly biased, they're getting a very biased view of, of health um, and health issues um, across the globe. And then when they tune in and watch the Olympics, they're seeing, um, you know, great displays of athleticism and strength and power. And then the advertising that they're seeing um, with that is from Cadbury and McDonald's. So I guess it's becoming a very complex space online, and this is really becoming our cultural e-wallpaper. And I guess it's changing as well. So traditionally advertising would usually be at the bus stop or on the train station as a young person, you know, coming home from school. But with spending less time um, out and about and more time at home, um, we're seeing a lot more advertising, obviously, online. And here's another example of Michael Klim, who was a major um, sponsor with McDonald's for the Olympics. And as you can see here, it was um, milk delivery. So again, promoting their del home delivery service um, and increasing this access accessibility to junk foods for young people. 
And I think this statistic, next statistic was most concerning to me, which is from a report on the human rights um, website of Australia, which shows that it's estimated that by a child's 13th birthday, advertisers will have gathered an average of 72 million data points about them. So by the time they enter you know, that, that critical period of high school, um, they're really an advertiser's dream because they know, already know so much about them from all of the different devices that we have. So it's really no wonder that we're seeing these increasing uh, risk factors for overweight and obesity within this um, population and other populations in Australia. So the, the data that I'm presenting here is from the Australian Health Survey in 2011 and 12. So now this data is over a decade old. Um, so it's likely that these numbers are potentially higher. But over 40% of um, energy intake for adolescents is coming from discretionary foods. So um, junk foods as well as sugar sweetened beverages. And only one in eight meet physical activity targets um, and less than 1% of adolescents are eating enough vegetables. And we know that 70% of preventable adult deaths from chronic diseases are linked to risk factors that start in adolescence. So it's no wonder that we're seeing increasing rates of overweight and obesity uh, within these populations. So this is data from the um, New South Wales Schools and Health Behaviour uh, Survey, which was last collected in 2017. Um, so it's a bit outdated as well. Um, but as you can see with the blue line, that is young people from 12 to 17 years. Um, and that looks like it's plateauing the overweight and obesity rates. But when you break it down by young people who are 12 to 15 years, we're seeing a slight decrease. But concerningly for older adolescents, 16 to 17 years, we're seeing an increase in the incidence of obesity. And that's, um, we can hypothesize that's because there has been a large investment in um, prevention and management of childhood obesity, but we haven't seen that same investment in um, the adolescent population. And this is some of the latest data from the New South Wales um, Population uh, Health Survey, um, looking at um, young people, they uh, reported as five to 16 years, and then again as 16 to 24 years. And the latest data that we have from 2019 um, shows that there's 23% 20, of young people, five to 16 years have um, over, had overweight or obesity. And then this increases substantially in that 16 to 24 year age group where we're seeing nearly 32% of young people having overweight and obesity. And we know in that um, young adult time period, it's the, it's the steepest trajectory of weight gain than at any other time um, during um, adulthood. And actually the national data um, paints a bit of a different picture. It shows a higher rate. So the data that we have from the National Health Service in 2017 and 18 shows that 41% of young people aged 15 to 24 years had overweight obesity. And we know from research from the University of Sydney as well as other institutions that a lifelong trajectory of obesity um, is difficult to reverse and does re can result in poor health outcomes. So there was recently a study um, from the US, which was a 20 year, uh, 24 year prospective cohort study. And that found that um, regardless of um, adult BMI, if a young person had a higher BMI during adolescence, they had a high um, likelihood of a premature heart attack. Um, and we also know that obesity can negatively impact on quality of life and the effects are greater in adolescence than at any other time during childhood. So it's really welcome news that the um, federal government have invested in um, developing a national obesity strategy. Um, so this strategy has been out for consultation um, with the community and now they will be doing, I think I read on, on the website in the next month or two, another consultation with a draft strategy. But I thought I'd just take you through um, some of the findings that they did have from the first consultation. Um, so they consulted with over 620 people across Australia, using uh, community forums as well as community discussions and a webinar and they also received responses from nearly 1500 people um, individuals and organizations and it was really positive within this strategy that they did identify young people as a priority group and they consulted with the consumer health forum of australia um, and they did engage with seven young people through focus groups they were a bit older than um, you know, they were aged between 21 and 26, but they did participate in um, some long focus groups. And these were the core themes that emerged from these consultations. So it's really um, 
positive that there was a strong emphasis on prevention um, to achieve population level change. Um, there was a strong theme of a systems approach, particularly in addressing the food systems as being a first priority. Uh, there needs to be a strong focus on equity, um, which is really important to not exacerbate any further inequalities, particularly in priority population groups, with one of those being young people. And there needs to be sustained and collective action. Um, and this is really important, you know, action that goes beyond a political um, cycle. So I thought I'd just briefly take you through um, what young people reported within this consultation and what they their thoughts were um, on what needs to be included in a national approach. Um, so it was good to note that there had it had been noted that there was a strong focus on younger children in current strategies and that gaps in um, strategies for older children. So it's good that that was recognised within this um, consultation. And I think some other really important points um, came out of this consultation. So um, young people noted that if they're living on a Centrelink payment, it's really not possible to pay for gym memberships and sports fees. So there really does need to be uh, alternate ways for young people to be physically active um, within the community. Um, they suggested developing targeted programs to continue the participation of sport and exercise beyond high school um, and into TAFE and university. There's a need to invest in low or no cost programs relating to improving um, cooking skills um, with a particular focus on schools and low income groups. Um, I think interestingly, they focus, they said there needs to be um, improved referral pathway for young people um, with, men uh, with mental health. So I think it's really important that it's sort of emerging that there needs to be more holistic approaches to um, health services for young people, um, incorporating mental health as well um, focus on obesity, which is really interesting. Um, the needs to focus on and consider mental health of young people in all of the programs and interventions. Um, we need to ensure information and programs are tailored to the needs of young people in partnership with them. And we really need to more clearly articulate the strategies and links between environmental sustainability. Um, so young people obviously are really um, interested in this space and that needs to be considered in strategy. So next I thought I'd just take you through some of the current um, strategies that are, ha are happening in New South Wales. Um, so we've done a, a review where we've evaluated um, and identified all of the strategies that are relevant to adolescents and then applied them and compared them to best practice recommendations. So um, obesity prevention and management um, has mainly been the responsibility of state and federal governments, I'm sorry, state and territory governments, um, and through federally funded primary health care networks. Um, so it's really welcome that there will potentially be a national strategy to obesity because at the moment it is very um, different between all of the different states. And it often, it's often hinders our approach because of the lack of division and lack of coordination across different sectors. Um, so in New South Wales, reducing overweight and obesity rates has really been focused on five to 16 year olds. So this has been a key priority of the New South Wales government over the last decade. So that was identified in the New South Wales Healthy Eating and Active Living Strategy, which is now, uh, which ended in 2018. And it's now being recognised in the New South Wales Youth Health Framework from 2017 to 2024. Um, so a piece of work that we've done recently is been comparing all of the car current government-led obesity prevention and management initiatives, guidelines and policies, which I'll term strategies moving forward, um, for adolescents in New South Wales against best practice recommendations. So we um, collated all of the best practice recommendations from um, key documents. Um, some of them are pictured here, but not all of them. Um, so key documents include uh, policy frameworks like the New South Wales uh, youth Health Framework, the National Action Plan uh, for um, the Health of Children and Young People, the National Stra uh, Strategic Framework for Chronic Conditions, as well as what we had the data that we had from the National Consultation uh, Report for the Obesity Strategy. And we also use key evidence reviews um, that are available in the Australian uh, context for adolescents. So we identified that there are currently 42 strategies. So these can be really small things up into big statewide um, guidelines and policies. Um, so 16 were operating in metropolitan um, areas. There was 11 regional initiatives, uh, nine statewide uh, initiatives, uh, two statewide guidelines and um, five policy directives. 
Um, so 10 initiatives were from primary um, healthcare networks. We identified four secondary prevention weight management services specifically for adolescents and five tertiary prevention weight management services. Um, and all of those services were, um, eight of the nine services were located within metropolitan Sydney and only one was located outside of that. And that was in the Hunter New England area. And there was publicly available nutrition and dietetic services available at 11 locations and 10 of those were through headspace services that were um, scattered across um, the, the state and a lot of those were in regional areas which was encouraging and there was three high school programs and two um, online or telehealth um, strategies so we identified um, best practice domains from those documents that I mentioned before um, for the obesity prevention and management specifically for adolescents. Um, so these were the domains that we recognised. So adolescents need to be supported to optimise their health. They should have accessible health services. Um, the health system needs to respond to their needs. They need supportive environments. There needs to be a strong focus on monitoring and evaluation of all of the different strategies. And there needs to be a strong focus on health equity. So I'll take you through some of the gaps that we identified, but I should also mention that across all of the different um, domains, we identified that there was action happening. So it was really encouraging to see that there was um, things happening across that space. Um, but I think there are definite, uh, definite um, ways to improve this for young people. So the first one was that adolescents are supported to optimise their health. So we identified, so one of the recommendations was um, public education campaigns on nutrition and physical activity. And we didn't identify any that were specific to young people. So a lot of the, um, the campaigns that are available are usually targeted at, at um, younger families with younger children. Um, so not specifically to young people. Um, we found limited online access to youth specific uh, tr and trustworthy health information. Um, so a lot of the information that is online um, is usually written about young people, not uh, written for them. And this was actually confirmed. We've just finished a series of focus groups with young people. Um, and a lot of them do try to go to sort of government um, based websites because they know that they're reputable. But when they get there, they find that the information really isn't relevant to them. And so therefore they're forced to go elsewhere to access information. Um, we found that there was limited evidence that adolescents who are, are at risk are actually directed to opportunities for health promotion and early intervention. So there is a, um, a policy within New South Wales that young people have to should have their height and weight recorded every time they encounter um, a public health New South Wales facility. Um, but it's only a KPI for that uh, number to be recorded. They don't have to be referred. Um, so within oral health services, public services across New South Wales, um, young people can actually, um, there is a guideline that they can actually be provided some, some intervention related to their diet um, or nutrition behaviours. Um, but we're really identifying that they're not be, sort of being referred on if they've been identified as high risk. And then a lot of the public health services that are available um, are mostly only available to young people after comorbidities are established. So a lot of those um, those clinics that are available, the weight management clinics, um, to be able to access the service, young people already have to have had established a comorbidity, so insulin resistance or hypertension, for example. So looking at accessible health services, there was limited secondary and tertiary services um, for adolescents, particularly those who are 16 to 17 years. Some of the services were capped, oh, sorry, um, stopped at um, 15 years. Um, and particularly, as I mentioned, they were all clustered within the metropolitan areas and there was only one service in the Hunter New England, but there was no other services um, outside of that. And we know during COVID-19 that a lot of services potentially did offer some telehealth um, during that time, but that information um, wasn't available uh, online. There's also limited access to specialist um, and counselling services related to this. So young people who are above 16 years within New South Wales can access the Get Healthy service, which is a telephone counselling service. Um, but there's really other, no other youth specific um, services that are available. And there's really no promotion to increase the uptake of programs for adolescents. This is one of the recommendations that we identified. So only one of the services that we found actually had an Instagram page or any sort of presence online that sort of um, described their service to young people. And we know from the New South Wales uh, Youth Health Framework that young people really do want to know about health services and read about them online before they attend. 
And as well, the health system needs to respond to the needs of young people. Um, so we did identify limited consumer participation, participation and community engagement. Um, so the New South Wales Youth Health Framework did include, um, you know, um, did consult and engage young people in the design of that, which was very encouraging. But we didn't find any other evidence of that um, with many of the other services and strategies that were available. As well, we identified limited holistic support to optimise quality of life. So these can be things like community gardens, which as we've seen from the National Obesity uh, Consultation, young people are very um, engaged around sustainability and climate change. So initiatives like this potentially would have really good uptake from young people. As well, we saw gaps across the other domains, um, so supportive environments. Um, so there was limited evidence of physical education and nutrition education interventions in schools. Um, and as well, we saw um, the, there are um, regulations around the food and drink that needs to be sold at New South Wales health facilities, um, but that hadn't been extended to other areas where we know there's a, a higher proportion of young people attending like recreation facilities and sporting clubs. Um, there was really limited evidence of any sort of evaluation or monitoring, particularly long-term evaluation, which is really um, critical to understand the sustainability of these, of these strategies and if they're having the effect that we intend for them to do. And I think most concerningly, there was a real lack of um, priority on um, uh, a priority populations. So only a handful of the 41 strategies specifically mentioned targeting um, young people who are potentially more at risk than other young people. So now I'll quickly take you through um, some of the digital health strategy, uh, studies that we're currently undertaking to, to hopefully address some of the gaps within um, this system. So that being um, young people not having access to, you know, uh, trustworthy and youth friendly information online and providing young people in uh, regional areas also the opportunity to access um, prevention services. So one of the studies that we're currently working on is the text bite study. Um, so this is a text message intervention that has been developed um, with young people. Um, so we know that over 90% of young people um, in Australia own a mobile phone. They can send upwards of 50 text messages per day and these do remain the primary form of communication for young people. Um, we know that text message programs for chronic disease um, are effective and we've, we've seen that in people with heart disease as well as people with uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, these kind of programs offer flexible delivery, they're simple and they're scalable. Most mobile phones can receive them and they don't cost anything to receive and you don't require an internet connection. And I think it's really important um, to consider this within the digital health space because obviously we, we often think of you know the latest technologies and advancements um, but for young people we really need technology that's not going to um, exacerbate that digital divide. So there was a recent um, statistic that came out during the pandemic that I think it was 68 percent of young people from um, the low socioeconomic backgrounds had access um, had the internet at home, but only um, but 91% of young people from higher um, socioeconomic backgrounds had the internet at home. So if we're, if we're developing really complex digital interventions that require, you know, a high, a, use a lot amount of a lot of data, um, it potentially won't be equitable to all young people. And interventions like this can easily be scaled at a population level. So we've co-designed this program with 40 consumers, so that was 25 um, young people as well as 15 um, health professionals, um, parents and teachers. And we also employed a young person as a research assistant to work with us um, during the development process of this study. So we developed a bank of 107 messages. Um, and this is a program targeted at young people who are at risk of obesity, so they're above a healthy weight, um, but they don't have any other comorbidities. So it's focused on um, purely on behaviour change, so improving nutrition and physical activity behaviours, and as well as embedding um, a, a focus on mental health and wellbeing, as well as sleep. And similar to what they found in the National um, Obesity Strategy, we also um, weaved in um, sustainability and messages related to that, as we knew that um, those, those issues were really important to young people. So we have a message bank now with over 100 messages um, relating to the four different behaviours um, that I mentioned. And also six of the messages um, encourage young people to text back and communicate um, with the health council. 
counsellor. So that's me on the other end of the line um, talking, to, talking to young people. So they can either have a phone call with me or they can text back and we can communicate and I can answer any of the questions that they have and support them that way. Another 25% of messages encourage two-way communication, so maybe a quiz or a short question. Um, and some of our messages do differ based on age. So some messages are more targeted at a younger age group and then other messages are targeted at a bit of an older age group. And we deliver this program through a um, commercial platform that we can easily monitor on a web browser and respond to all of the different messages every day. So we're currently testing this um, program in a randomised control trial. So we're recruiting 150 young people. I hoped by this date I would have more data to share with you, but we have had some challenges which I'll take you through in a moment. So we've recruited about one third of all people, um, all of the participants so far. So 75 will be randomised to the intervention group and then another 75 to the control group. And then we follow them up at six months and then again at 12 months. And the young people who are uh, randomised to the control group will have the opportunity to receive the program at the end of the 12 months. Um, so our primary outcome is BMI-Z score and our secondary outcomes are related to diet, physical activity, sleep quality, as well as um, depression risk and eating disorder risk. Um, so you can still refer to the study if you know any eligible young people, so that we're looking for young people 13 to 18 years who are above the healthy weight, so more at risk um, than, than the general um, young, young people population. Uh, they have access to an active mobile phone, uh, living in Australia, and we do screen for eating disorders, uh, risk and depression risks, which I'll take you through in a moment. Um, and it's all online, so there's no in-person visit. So they can be uh, referred um, using the expression of interest form or um, via email. So I'll take you through a bit of, I guess, the process evaluation data of this study so far. So as I mentioned, we're about um, one third of the way through our recruitment. Um, so we started recruitment at the beginning of last year. Um, so before, this was before the COVID-19 pandemic. So at that time, I guess digital consent, I guess, wasn't as, um, I guess, maybe prolific as it is now. So that's one of the really positive things about the pandemic is that it has sort of pushed that forward. So at the time, we were still capturing uh, young people coming in to sign the consent form with their parents. Um, and as well, we were capturing um, the measured height and weight. Um, so we had to sort of change our approach during the, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit because it wasn't going to be possible. That's actually been a really positive aspect because we've been able to offer the study to a lot more people. Um, we do screen for um, eating disorder risk and depression because obviously these are two um, big health issues within this population. But I guess one of the challenges that we had was there wasn't really a screening tool developed for this population. A lot of the tools that have been developed with cut points uh, for young people who are well above the healthy weight. So I think there is a lot more to, to explore within this space, particularly in a community intervention. So a lot of, in, um, I guess, more intensive interventions potentially have a medical practitioner or someone on site who can easily, um, if someone screams high, they can easily be seen by that person and then cleared or, or, or you know, referred it on. But within our, within our setting, we have to screen them and then we send them out back into the community to deal with this with their parents and to go find, you know, see a GP and get clearance to come back. Um, so I guess that, that's an area that does require a lot more research within this space. Another thing that we've learned so far is that we've had actually over um, 1,200 EOIs for the study and one third of them have been um, eligible, so young people who are, are a bit more at risk. Um, so I think that number has really shown to us that there is a, such a demand for this kind of services for young people, so we didn't expect to have that many EOIs. Um, but from all of the young people that have been eligible, getting them on board with the study has been really challenging. Um, so as soon as they find out that there's a phone call with us to do this screening, we can, we often, so many of them drop off. Um, and maybe it's because it's a bit too difficult, um, you know, you know, it's burdensome or they're a bit worried about what we're going to ask them. But there is that challenge. So um, I guess that's something that we're looking to explore in the next study that we do and hopefully having a more streamlined onboarding process for young people. Um, some of the positives of the study so far is that we've had a really high retention rate of the young people that we have. I think we've only lost um, around two people so far. Um, we're getting really positive quali um, qualitative feedback during the interviews that um, Rebecca is doing for the study. Um, 
And as well, there's been different levels of engagement. So young people, some young people are really engaged with the messages, which is great, but other, other young people are, I guess, more passive consumers. So we're really understanding that, you know, who those young people are and how we can best support them. I thought I'd just show with, share with you some of the um, things that we've received back. So um, we don't encourage any photos to come back, but young people can send them back. So here's some examples. So some of the messages are focused on um, time management, for example, and we ask them for their best time management strategies that they're using maybe for their study or to balance their work and social life. Um, and, he, and some young people have sent back photos. So that was really exciting. And as well to see photos that they're sending back of some of the, um, I guess, healthy snacks that they've been um, having during their study breaks and different things like that. And this was a lovely quote that we received from a young person who had who participated in the intervention group. And he was saying that he hoped to see the program um, be mainstream for all young people across Australia um, to be as ha uh, healthy and as happy as they can be. Um, so we're really hoping to have the recruitment complete for this study, I guess, by the end of the year and then be able to share data around the finding of the text by study next year. But this has really led to our latest study. So it's exciting that I'm able to lead a MRFF um, primary care study, which is um, building on a lot of the lessons that we've learned from the text bites intervention so far. So as we've seen, there's been a really strong demand for this program um, with the you know increased amount of EOIs. And I guess young people really wanting to just um, onboard them potentially themselves into the study and consent themselves. So that's something we're going to explore with this study. And it's going to be open to all young people um, with the primary outcome being improving uh, physical activity and nutrition. And I guess with this study as well, we have the opportunity to, you know, keep it simple in terms of um, two-way communication through text message, but we also have the, um, the option to include uh, picture messages as well as include videos within the program as well. So this program will be centred um, um, with young people at centre as well, so using frameworks such as the World Health Organisation um, Digital Health Framework for Young People. We're also really excited that we've nearly finished uh, recruitment for our youth advisory group, which will support um, this Health for Me study. Um, so they'll be the driving force behind all of the content that we put in the program and providing a lot of um, advice and co-design of all the new message bank that we developed for the study. So that if you know any young people as well, that youth advisory group um, applications close tomorrow and I can share with you the link. Um, but they'll be recruiting 12 young people um, and they'll be paid for their time. And they'll be part of a year long program and we're also going to evaluate um, that youth advisory group as well to really understand um, um, what young people got out of the experience, um, as well as obviously we're hoping that we develop a really positive intervention and, and we, we see positive health outcomes in the intervention. But we also want to see positive um, outcomes for young people in terms of improved leadership skills, um, improved confidence and improved um, knowledge around research um, as well. So for this study, we're looking to recruit 330 young people with their primary outcomes being um, physical activity and, and uh, vegetable intake as the other co-primary outcome. I think I have five more minutes, so I'll briefly just touch on the work that we're doing in the online food delivery space. Um, so obviously creating supportive digital environments where young people can access healthcare support is really important, but it's also important to note that obviously on this space, there's so many commercial um, um, also influences coming in. So, and obviously with, with, a lot, with a lot of money to be able to advertise to young people. So this is a space we I became particularly interested in last year. Um, so briefly, unhealthy diets are really well established in adolescence. And as I mentioned before, they increase the rates of obesity. And over 60% um, of young people with overweight or obesity actually have um, at least one risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, and 20% have over two or more. Um, and we know that data from the Cardia study, which was uh, over 3,000 young adults, found that a healthy diet during young adulthood is strongly associated uh, with lower cardiovascular risk in middle age. So to implement effective preventative measures, we need to really understand the environmental influences of food choice on young people. And I think this was a really um, interesting photo series that was published, I think, in Time magazine, which showed young people's diets from all over the world. And there wasn't anyone from Australia, but I guess the similar dietary pattern that we have is that of America. And I guess this just shows that, you know, young people um, in Australia and in America are really exposed to a lot of, a lot of fast food. 
And obviously our food environment is defined as the collective physical, economic and policy and sociocultural surroundings that influence our food choice. And so here's an example. This is actually a photo I took at the University of Sydney of a medical student event. So this was the, the food that they were provided with pizzas and Coke. Um, so, you know, and sometimes if that's the only food that is available, it's the food you're gonna eat um, because it's the easiest choice. So our digital food environment um, is the online setting which influences people's food choice and their behavior. So that it can include um, social media, as well as the digital health promotion interventions that I mentioned before, but it also includes digital food marketing and online food retail. So online food delivery is defined as, um, so I don't, most people probably, in, if you're living in a, a, a metropolitan area might have used this during the pandemic. Um, and obviously they were able to offer a really important service during the pandemic. Um, so you're able to order food on your phone and that is sent then to the restaurant or the fast food outlet of your choice. And then they prepare the food and then a freelance courier will pick up your food and drop it off to your home. So you, you don't even have to get off the couch really. Um, in Australia, there's three main operators. Um, and they have an estimated um, nine to 16,000 food outlet partners. But some of the data that we've captured recently um, is showing that that's now nearly at 37,000 unique food outlet partners because a lot of food outlets were forced to, you know, to join these, um, these services during the pandemic to be able to you know, stay in business. Um, and they're increasingly operating out of um, major capital cities, but they're really trying to expand into regional areas. And it is really a, a, a booming global industry. Um, so as I mentioned before, obviously online advertising is huge. And here's just some of the examples of, of the advertising um, of these services that, are, that is happening, and particularly during the pandemic. So here you can see they're using you know, um, KFC buckets to uh, measure out the distance, the 1.5 metre social distancing rule. Um, and as well, they're offering a lot of different uh, free delivery and things like that during the pandemic. And even before the pandemic, um, this photo here um, was something that I received at Central Station in Sydney. So I was getting the bus home um, one afternoon and there was a lot of university students and high school students. And so they're paying people to hand out these vouchers to get them to sign up. So once they're signed up, they're a customer and they can be sent advertising. Um, so it's, there's so many different strategies to get young people on board with these services. And of course, now they've um, moved into alcohol delivery as well, which is another major, I guess, something to keep an eye on, particularly uh, for young people. Um, and just briefly, um, young people are the highest users of these services from the data that we have available at the moment. Um, and we know that young uh, people that do use these tend to have a higher BMI as well as um, higher levels of education and income, and they may consume you know, fast food and sugary drinks more frequently. So just quickly, we've, we've um, done three pieces of work in this space. So we've looked at a multi-country study where we've looked at um, the healthiness of food outlets and, and the geographical reach of these um, of the food outlets. Um, we've looked at the nutritional quality of many items and we've also done a study where we've looked at the advertising and promotion of these services on Instagram. Um, so just quickly, they, um, this is what we found from our study in Sydney and in Auckland. Um, so the majority of the food outlets, the most popular food outlets on these services are actually fast food chains. So McDonald's, KFC, and they have a lot of buy and a lot of sway within these companies because they can offer, you know, so many deals for consumers, so free delivery. And it just really extends the reach of where that food outlet is because they can now deliver, you know, upwards to three to five kilometres away. Um, and, you know, you might have, you know, driven there or walked there before, but, you know, now you can easily get it delivered. And a lot of the most popular menu items are actually unhealthy foods. So these are the foods that people are seeing first when they look at these platforms. Um, a second study we did was we're looking at independent food outlets. So things like your kebab shop, your local fish and chip shop. And we looked at the sort of the marketing strategies that they use within the app to promote food products. And we found that a lot more of the unhealthy foods were the foods that you'd see first when you look at that food outlet. Um, and compared to a healthier food. Um, unhealthy foods were also more likely to have a photo and they were also more likely to be part of a family meal deal. 
And in the third study that we've done so far, we looked at um, the advertising and promotion of these services on Instagram. So obviously Instagram being a very popular site that young people, um, the social media site for young people. And particularly we looked at during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we found that um, one third of all of the posts um, in 2020 from, um, we looked at three different countries and three different services within those countries. So there was a total of uh, nine accounts that we looked at. And a lot of the posts were referring to COVID-19. And of those posts, a lot of the foods that were pictured, um, over 85% were actually discretionary or junk food items. So it was associated with the pandemic um, and then promoting, I guess, unhealthy uh, foods as well. And we also found that, that they really uh, COVID washed their advertising as well. So they use strategies such as combating the pandemic, um, appropriating frontline workers and providing them with vouchers. Um, yeah, which is which is fine, but we know a lot of the foods that they have available are unhealthy foods. Um, as I mentioned before, they're set using strategies around selling social distancing and they're helping to accelerate digitalization. Um, so just, um, wrapping everything up, I guess there is a digital disruption and acceleration occurring. Um, we really need to make sure that we don't exacerbate any of the digital divide for any of the really um, priority population groups, particularly young people. Um, we need to understand the effectiveness of simple digital interventions um, with a focus on implementation and scale up. Um, so it's really great to un understand all of the latest apps and technologies, but we really need to get them out there and get young people involved and, and support them um, to improve their health behaviours. Um, our findings suggest that online food delivery may facilitate the purchase of poor nutritional quality foods, so junk foods, and this area really does require a serious and immediate consideration in public health strategies and policies. I'd just like to thank um, all of the different people that have been involved um, in the, the studies that I've mentioned um, in this webinar um, as well. So, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Um, we do have some questions. And um, <laughs> so I might um, start with the uh, on the top. Um, so I'm not sure which um, study this was referring to, but um, I, the question is from Christine. Are young people diagnosed with type 2 diabetes eligible to participate in your study? It might be the first one, the text. Yeah, um, no. So we're, we're, we're supporting young people um, before they've established any of um, comorbidities because we know that the current services, there are services available for young people and they do require obviously more um, specialised care than what this program offers. This program is a population program to support young people to, you know, to positive small behaviour change, whereas some, a condition like that does require more management. So no, they're not eligible. Yeah. And um, Marjan, uh, Marjan has asked, um, so thanks for the great talk, but, and of the 107 messages, um, for example, physical activity, uh, can you please give an example of what the message was in relation to that? Yeah, so um, some of the messages, for example, um, that we have, um, I guess one is referring to um, the Active Kids Voucher. So that message often gets a lot of attention. Some young people don't know that they're actually eligible. So that gives them and their family um, a small voucher to go spend um, on you know, sporting equipment or um, um, fees for their um the sport that they want to participate in. So that's another one. So key things that they can access. Um, we've put some, I guess, funner ones around um, uh, podcasts and things like that that they can do to, you know, if they're wanting to go for a walk and what they can listen to or they sometimes we ask them to text back what they're listening to. And I've actually heard a few really interesting podcasts that I hadn't heard of before that they're following, um, going to the park, you know, with their friends. And, and I was talking to a young um guy in the study the other day and he um he said he got that message and it was quite a simple message but he was like oh it was so great I went and got my basketball and you know I um, called up my friends and we both headed down to the park and I hadn't played basketball in a while so it was a really good reminder for me to you know get out of the house and stop studying and go play basketball um yeah so they can be they can seem quite simple but it's really interesting to see that they are having a, hopefully a positive effect on young people Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I just was looking through the questions and I saw a question that's kind of related to this. So 
Um, it's about how you manage and automate the sending of the text messages. How do you do that? And um, do you have to be online all the time? So Nicola and, and um, you soon have asked those questions. Yeah, so we use a program, a um, commercial program, um, which has a um, sequencer software. So the messages are all programmed within that. So all we have to do is um, once Rebecca um, enrolls someone in the study, she just enters their mobile phone and their preferred name um, into that. And then that will feed then into the full program of messages that they get. Um, and then um, they're automatically sent out um, based on the date that they enroll. Um, and we've scheduled them all so to be appropriate for a certain day so if it's like a, a message around uh, fast food it might it will go on a weekend or a Friday as opposed to going midweek when we know you know a lot of people are consuming fast foods on the weekend um, so it's all pre-programmed and then in terms of responding to the messages yes it's like a web browser um, so I'm the person that responds to the messages and monitors that um, and so I actually wanted to Quite a few different studies one with women with breast cancer as well so it's quite, it's quite different you're getting a lot of different um, messages back yeah but it's quite simple you just can respond to them as they come in online um, and we tell young people that you know we're not we it is monitored all the time but we, you, we may not be guaranteed a response straight away um, obviously we have safety protocols in place but we haven't had any incidents at all we've had to to do any of that yeah, but it is quite straightforward and, and I guess it's quite fun to reply. I think it's nice to have a, a quick chat uh, conversation and help someone that way. Great. Thank you. Um, sounds like uh, it's quite an active. <laughs> I mean, it, it does sound like it might be quite time consuming, I have to say. But, uh, yeah, um, obviously I, manage it. yeah, it's not that I don't think it's that time consuming. Um, the one I was managing, which was the Empower SMS, which was the one for women after breast cancer treatment. That one was actually a bit more active. Um, particularly, I think, because a lot of the people, um, they um, write back, it's just thanking you for each of the messages, which was really nice. And we didn't have to respond to all of those ones, but a lot of the inbox was just like, oh, thanks. It was Anna or Rebecca who signed them up for that study. Thank you so much. That was really, you know, that message made my day or, you know, I hope you're all having a nice day. Yeah, so it was really nice that they didn't associate it with being sort of a, it is automated, but they recognised that hopefully there was where someone behind the messages, um, yeah. which is nice. Yeah, that must make a, a big difference. Yeah. In that. <laughs> but um, so, so we have a question from Smita. Thank you, Stephanie, for an excellent presentation. How do you see existing programs such as um, Smita Salsa and yeah. Youth Voices programs that are currently being offered to schools in Western Sydney working with your services and programs? Yeah, I think it's great because I think there can there can't be one you know, program to solve this. We need a collection of different services available. Um, so it's so important to have the programs like the Salsa program, um, which is happening in schools, because obviously, you know, if you have positive messages in schools and then, you know, young people can sign up for, for programs like this where they can get some, some support outside of the school setting as well. So I see them hopefully, work, you know, working um, just to really synergize and support each other. Uh, obviously, I know that they both have similar messages around positive behavior, so you're constantly just reinforcing those messages. And if they're able to get that support at school and then at home and in the community, I think it's you know very beneficial for young people um, as well. Yeah, excellent. Um, so a couple of other questions. Um, one in relation to um, the youth advisory for co-design how did you go about setting recruiting and setting that up we'd be interested to know yeah so that was um this is through our mrff um grant that we recently got so that was quite exciting so we um have funding within that to be able to offer young people um to be able to pay them for, uh, for a little bit of their time um so we set up the application form uh, and we've sent it out to all different networks and we're just sharing it that way and we're asking young people to answer two, two questions about you know what why do they want to join and then what sort of experience can they bring to that and that can just be their life experience we're not expecting them to have any sort of skill set and then we have a um a quota where we're, it will be um gender balance and we're also hoping to get um, representation from young people who speak another language at home um, to get a mix of ethnicity and also um, people from regional areas. Um, so it's been really exciting to see all the applicants come in and um, we're going to be going through those tomorrow and then um, selecting young people um, and we already have the chair recruited for that as well um, who's someone I've been working with for a little bit as well. So it would be really exciting to get that established and then to start to work with them to develop the, the program, the new program. 
Excellent. Great to see that you've got that youth co-design given that you identified a, a huge gap <laughs> in the policies and, and programs with respect to that aspect. So we've got some more questions. Um, thanks, Stephanie. Very exciting study. I was wondering if the uptake of the one-on-one -on -one chat, uh, what the uptake of the one-on-one -on -one chat is with young people. Um, from Catherine. So they get offered um, six six different um six phone calls over the six month period so one per month and they get a message every month um to remind them that they can just text back and and, and we'll pick a time that suits them so i can do those phone calls with them um uh, you know up until um 7 p.m at night and then on saturday mornings as well um so i think we're getting around um probably 50 percent of people taking part in that um and then it, and then within that it's really sporadic as well how they actually engage with the call so they I don't think I don't think I've had anyone do all six of them um and sometimes I get a bit worried I'm like oh, I didn't hear from them um, I hope they're okay and then you know they text back oh I've had exams or something you know it's been super busy um I hope you're going okay Stephanie which is <laughs> it's really nice but yes it's sort of which is good because I think that's what they they want they want something that's sort of tailored to their to their life and you know they might let me know that they have you know exams coming up so they're not going to be able to respond or can we push it back two weeks because i've got this coming up um but i guess the ones that obviously there's young people who i've done a few phone calls with but you can maybe sense that it's not really their thing and then then they don't respond to the rest and they just enjoy texting back whereas other young people are super chatty i think like at all different populations people some people respond to it some people don't um but we're capturing all the data on um the goals that we set during those phone calls and then you know we'll have all the data on the types you know maybe there are certain types of people that prefer that over others fantastic um and louise has asked um would you please comment on any social differential in accessing and responding to and being influenced by the messages um i haven't had, had so any social differential um, I couldn't tell you that information at the moment because I'm only going off, you know, their first name in the program um, and their age. I haven't got it, um, had a look, but I can have, we will be exploring all of that when we analyse all of the data. What's your sense or hunch about that, Lenny? Um, we are, I think it just did quite a, I, I am sensing there is quite a variety. Um, and I guess in, I'm thinking a lot of potentially older adolescents who those, um, a lot, I'm speaking to a lot of doing exams and, um, you know, 17 or 18 years, they're the ones who are more engaging with the phone calls, whereas the younger ones potentially are a bit more apprehensive about it and a bit, I guess, nervous and happy with the messages. So I guess the age is potentially something that's coming up. Um, yeah, but I, I'd have to, again, look at whether there's anything else um, later on with the data. Yeah. Well, hopefully that bodes well for that older, age, older adolescent age group, which are the ones that are most at risk as you told yeah, us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Or showed us early on. Yeah. So Danielle has said, wonderful presentation. Would you please, um, or could you please confirm the data source and source of information of users of online food service delivery? Will you be unpacking this work further given the high levels of youth using these services? Yeah, so the data that we have at the moment is only from, um, there was one cross-sectional study that was conducted in Perth, um, which was pre-pandemic to identify who the people are and, you know, their, their behaviours. Um, and then the rest of the data that we know at the moment is from um, industry reports or um, consumer sort of organisations like Corey uh, Morgan was the one that published some of the data. Um, so CCG is working with me and she's doing her PhD in this topic and she's going to be doing some an excellent study to look at um, sort of who are the main users and what are the reasons why they're using these services. So are they receiving free delivery or like, or, 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 you know, are they really busy? Like what are the, what are the factors associated with that? So we, yeah, we'll definitely be exploring that further and sort of understanding who that population is, um, particularly as these services grow and sort of try to build their customer base. Because we also know that um, before the latest lockdown in Sydney, that um, Uber Eats reported that people had returned to normal restaurant or eating up um, you know, pre-budget, pre-pandemic levels, but they were still consuming higher levels of takeaway food. Um, so it's obviously potentially had, you know, changed our behaviours during this time. So, and obviously they're probably wanting to retain all of those customers. Um, yeah, so that's something we'll definitely be exploring in the future. Great, yeah. So um, there, from what you've suggested, it, it, it indicates that probably there has been an increase over COVID in the 
consumption of fast foods compared to an ordinary, you know, normal eat? Yeah. Would, would that be? Uh, potentially, but also there's also been um, reports of more home cooking as well. Um, so I guess okay. it would depend as well. I think there needs to be a, a little bit more unpacked, but um, yeah. I know we have been doing a lot more home cooking, but as well, these services have been available. Um, but there there are some really good studies coming out in this space. Um, some studies I think I've seen that, they, you know, a lot of, you know, multi-country studies that have explored this, where their results are coming out. So it'd be really good to, to review those when they do when they do publish their findings. Excellent. Well, thank you, um, Stephanie. That was such a great presentation. We've come right to the end <laughs> of our time. So um, really well done. And thanks all to the audience too for all of your great questions. It, it was an absolutely excellent presentation. And, you know, all the best for those amazing studies um, and um, all that. Uh, it's really pleasing to see how you're engaging with young people and, and really targeting young people for these programs, given the, the, the gaps that you've identified and how much they have to gain. Thank you, Rachel. Anyway, so thanks to everyone. We'll be, um, we'll see you again for our next webinar, which, and I don't have the information on that yet, but we, we that will get be sent out to you in in an email in a forthcoming email so thanks to everybody bye bye now